Thank you all of you for being here this evening. This is a Friday night and I understand it's school vacation. There are many other things that you could be doing um, and you have paid me a, an immense compliment by being here. So thank you very much. And I would also like to thank the Institute of Public Affairs who proposed and organized and um, is funding this tour um, that's starting here and going on to three more cities. Um, these people, my experience of this organization is that they are amazing. They are very well organized, they are efficient, they are pleasant to deal with, and they have been treating me like a queen. So I think that Australia is um, very fortunate to have this organization. I'd like to um, begin my, pardon me, um, my formal remarks by offering you my condolences regarding your brand new carbon tax. <laughs> A professor at the University of Colorado recently wrote about Australia and he titled the piece, Welcome to Fantasy Island. <laughs> Now, previously, he had referred to the UK in that manner, but on July 1st, the title officially passed to you. <laughs> As all of you know, the new carbon tax is going to make everything in Australia more expensive, even though your government seems to be trying to prevent people from talking about that. And the new carbon tax is also going to add a great deal more bureaucracy and red tape to your lives, especially if you are business people. So is it going to be worth it? Is all that pain and aggravation going to actually accomplish the tax's stated goal? Unfortunately not. And the simple reason is that your government has committed you to an emissions reduction scheme that is not uh, realistic. It's pie in the sky. It is, um, it's way out there. So this uh, professor that I mentioned, let's see if this works. His name is Roger Pilkey Jr. This is the Welcome to Fantasy Island. Uh, published on June 18th, and it so happens that Roger Pilkey Jr. actually truly sincerely believes that carbon emissions represent an environmental threat. That being said, he can do math, and he has done the math for Australia, and he has concluded that your emission goals will be all but impossible to meet and that your timetables are fanciful at best, thus Fantasy Island. He says that the only way Australia has a hope of meeting your stated, publicly stated emissions targets is that if you stopped using coal altogether by 2020, so that's eight years from now, and that in order to do, in, in order to replace the, the electricity that is currently generated by coal, that you would need to build, and actually it's you would need to plan and commission and build and test and then begin running 56 nuclear power plants. <laughs> All in the next eight years. Or there, are, there is an alternative. There's always more than one answer. You could build 12,670 industrial-sized solar plants. So in order to get to that number in the next eight years, you would have to be bringing 30 of these plants online each and every week between now and then. By the way, that has never been done before. <laughs> Anywhere. In other words, you people are screwed. <laughs> you find yourselves in an absurd situation. You're paying a carbon tax 
but with or without this carbon tax, you have no hope of meeting your goals. So like any rational person, you are left asking, how did this happen? How did things get this crazy? Tonight, I'm going to try to provide part of the answer to that question. How did things get this crazy? Now, Australia, like the rest of the world, is part of the United Nations. And for the past 24 years, a United Nations body has been writing reports about climate change. That body is called the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And its reports are informally known as the Climate Bible. Now, whether we live here in Melbourne or in a remote part of Canada, if we take the trouble to write a letter to our elected representatives expressing some concern about climate change policy, we will almost certainly get a reply back that tells us that the IPCC says that greenhouse gas emissions are dangerous. We will be told, as we indeed we have been told for many years, that expensive climate change measures are necessary because the IPCC says so. A week after taking office, Kevin Rudd, your former prime minister, told a UN meeting in Bali, quote, climate change is the defining challenge of our generation, unquote. That remark immediately followed a sentence in which he discussed the IPCC's 2007 report. So there's nothing vague or debatable about this. There is a very direct line between what the IPCC has been saying and doing and what the highest levels of government tell you and believe are necessary with respect to climate change. Now, it turns out that lots of people from Kevin Rudd on downward have a totally mistaken view of what the IPCC is and what the IPCC does. About three years ago, I began researching climate change and I repeatedly was hearing about this paragon of virtue, this gold standard organization, this last best word on climate change. And it occurred to me that the book that I thought I was writing on climate change generally, that I, it actually should be about that organization because it was so powerful and so influential and there is not very much written about it. So the result is a volume with a very long title called The Delinquent Teenager Who Was Mistaken for the World's Top Climate Expert. Now, it's an unusually long title, and in my experience, people either really love it or they really don't. <laughs> But the reason I chose it is that I was, as I was doing my research, I formed this mental image in my head of what the IPCC was. And it was a meticulous, upstanding professional in business attire. It was respectable, it was reliable, it was trustworthy. That was what everyone was telling me about the IPCC. Unfortunately, the more I learned about the IPCC, that image faded and a new one came into focus. And so the image that replaced it was actually of a slapdash teenager with his shirt hanging out, full of bravado, breaking the rules left, right, and center, and really seemingly having a very difficult time telling the difference between right and wrong. So if my book with this very long title were to have a subtitle, that subtitle would be something along the lines of almost nothing you've heard about the IPCC <laughs> is actually true. So let's start with a very simple question. There's nothing complicated, there's nothing um, complex about this. Who writes IPCC reports? 
Well, according to Seth Borenstein, who is a science writer for the Associated Press and has been in that role for some time, these are the world's top climate scientists. According to Jeffrey Lean, who's the environment editor at the UK's Independent, these are not just climate scientists, they're the world's top scientists. The Atomic Energy Agency Bulletin and Energy Sector Publication, recognized experts in their field, and Akeem Steiner, who is the head of the UN Environment, <coughs> Environmental Program, has said these are the best scientific minds. Green NGOs have been telling us pretty much the same thing. According to the World Wildlife Fund, these are the world's leading scientists. Greenpeace says they're the world's leading climate scientists. And the US League of Conservation Voters, these are the world's brightest scientists. And then you get the IPCC's leadership itself. So Robert Watson, who is the chairman, from 1997 to 2002, he says these are the world's best experts. And Rajendra Pachori, who is currently the chairman, has told us these are the world's best specialists. So just to give a bit of a flavor of the kind of thing that the current chairman goes around saying, these are people who have been chosen on the basis of their track record, on, the base, on their record of publications, on the research that they have done, these are people who are at the top of their profession. Okay, so you get the gist. Everyone has been saying these kinds of things. So that's why I thought the IPCC, my goodness, it's just, it's in a league of its own. So it means we have a widespread consensus about a very simple question, who writes IPCC reports? So journalists, energy sector publications, UN officials, green activists, IPC spokespeople, they all agree. Well, who really writes IPCC reports? One category is 20-something graduate students. Now, Richard Klein is currently a geography professor in the Netherlands. He became a lead author for the IPCC at the tender age of 25. Now, he was promoted to a chapter head, which they call a coordinating lead author, at the age of 28, even though it would still be six years before he completed his doctorate. Lawrence Bauer is also from the Netherlands. He's currently employed by a university there. He was an IPCC lead author in 1999 before he earned his master's degree. <laughs> in fact, it would take him more than a decade um, to learn, earn his PhD after he first started serving as an IPCC lead author. And Sari Kovats is probably the most egregious example that I've stumbled across. And all of these really were, it was, it was quite by accident. I started doing the math when I looked at their CV and it didn't add up. So Sari Kovats back in 1994 was one of only 21 people in the entire world selected by the IPCC to write its first chapter that examined how climate change might affect human health. Now, remember Rajendra Pachuri talking about people's publication records? Well, this young woman wouldn't have her first paper published until three years after that. And she, in fact, did not receive her PhD until 16 years after the IPCC had decided that she was one of the world's top experts. Now, is the IPCC embarrassed about this? Um, actually, no. So she contributed to their 1996 report. She contributed to their 2001 report, their 2007 report. And now she's back leading a chapter for the IPCC report that is currently underway. So 20-something <coughs> graduate students. Now another category is people who come from the right country or the right gender. 
And this is a very shocking thing to say, um, but I think it's important to, for us to remember that the IPCC is a UN organization. It therefore cares about though all those things that other UN organizations care about. It cares about diversity. It cares about gender balance. It cares about regional balance and whether, how many people are from the developing world and how many people are from um, um, developed economies. So it, you know, unfortunately, um, that's what's happened with the IPCC. Despite the marketing message, this is exactly what has happened here. And how we know that this has been going on, how I've um, established that this has been going on, is that in 2010, a, a remarkable thing happened, and, and Bob Carter mentioned the whole Glacier scandal. Um, and um, as a result of that, the Inter Academy Council decided to investigate the IPCC. Now, this organization is more than 20 years old, and that's never happened before. So that was a remarkable thing. And the Inter Academy Council is an organization made up of science academies from around the world. So they struck a committee, and one of the ways that that committee gathered its information was it posted online a questionnaire inviting people to talk about their IPCC experience. And afterward, it removed all the names of the people who had responded, so it anonymized the answers, but the answers were made public, and it is a huge document. It's a 678-page PDF, but it's available online, and if you go through that document, and I assure you that I did with a fine-tooth comb, you will find all kinds of people talking about the fact that many of their colleagues on the IPCC chapter, working on IPCC chapters, were not the world's finest scientific minds. And so as early as page 16 in this report, you have someone saying that some of the lead authors in their chapter were clearly not qualified. And if you jump ahead 100 or so pages, you find someone else saying half of the lead authors were not competent, but were there because they were politically correct appointments from developing countries. And then you go ahead several more hundred pages and you have someone else who says all IPCC personnel decisions are political before being scientific. So there are lots of these kinds of comments. And depending on who you're talking to and who you believe is either some or it's half, or it's all of these appointments have, uh, you know, have been informed by considerations that have nothing to do with scientific competence. So another category, we have professional activists writing chapters of the IPCC reports. So Richard Moss has been involved with the IPCC for 20 years. He's an American. During part of that time, he was actually cashing a paycheck from the WWF. Now, I understand that here in Australia, it's called the World Wide uh, Fund for Nature. In North America, they still go by their old um, name, the World Wildlife Fund, but it's the same organization. So we have someone who's on staff with the WWF, and we have Bill Hare. Now, if you go um, on the internet, you can find a blog post on Greenpeace's, blog, uh, Greenpeace's website that calls Hare a Greenpeace legend. He has been involved for a long time with that organization, and he's not just peripherally involved with the IPCC. In fact, when the synthesis report, which is the summary of summary, was written, for the 2007 report, he was one of only 40 people on the core writing team. He's right there at the center of the action. More professional activists. We have Michael Oppenheimer. He's an American scientist. He spent more than 20 years employed by the Environmental Defense Fund, which is a very wealthy, very influential US green NGO. He's now leading a chapter 
of AR5, which is the short form for Assessment Report 5, which is the IPCC report that's now underway, and we expect that it will be released in 2013 or 2014. And Jennifer Morgan. Jennifer Morgan is also involved in the current report preparation, and she used to be the World Wildlife Fund's chief spokesman on climate change. She looks like a very fun, very pleasant person, but she is not one of the world's finest scientific minds. <laughs> she has spent her entire career working for green activist groups. What is she doing within a mile of the IPCC? <coughs> so, Something very odd happened just at the end of writing my book. I had a fact checker who went through and double checked everything that I was saying and he said to me, you know, there's a lot more of these IP recognizable names um, than I think you've talked about. And, and what I discovered very late in the writing process was that in 2004, the WWF did something that I think was very curious it deliberately began to recruit IPCC personnel. And by 2008, according to internal WWF documents that are again available online, it had persuaded 130 people that it referred to as leading climate scientists, mostly but not exclusively from the IPCC, to join its own parallel panel. So at the very moment when the world was trusting these leading climate scientists to dispassionately and objectively look at the scientific evidence as to whether human beings are actually affecting the climate, these 130 leading climate scientists couldn't figure out that it was a bad idea to get into bed with a lobby group, a lobby group that has an interest in affecting the very questions that they were supposed to be examining. Now, how did this play out? Well, it means, <clears throat> pardon me, that two-thirds of the chapters of the last IPCC report included at least one author who is affiliated with the WWF. Two-thirds of the 44 chapters. One-third of those chapters were actually led by a WWF-affiliated scientist. And there was a chapter in particular that made some um, decisions about how species extinction might be affected by climate change. In that chapter, there were eight people associated with the WWF. Now, when my book first was published last October, within a week, the WWF issued a press release because I say in my book that the IPCC has been infiltrated by the WWF. And they issued a press release saying that's ludicrous and that's not, there's no concern, there's just a little overlap, a little overlap. Well, when two thirds of your chapters include at least one WWF affiliated person, I don't think that's overlap. I think that's an invasion. So, who really writes IPCC reports? We have students, unqualified scientists from the developing world, professional activists, and scientists who are so politically unsophisticated, so naive, so obtuse, you choose, that they couldn't figure out it was a bad idea to align themselves with a lobby group. So what does this mean? It means there was a very simple question, who writes IPCC reports? There was a widespread worldwide consensus as to what the answer to that question was, and that consensus was wrong. Gee, consensus was wrong. That never happens. <laughs> Many IPCC personnel don't come close 
to being the world's finest scientific minds. Now, you might make an argument that, you know, maybe it doesn't matter, but as Bob Carter mentioned, this is the standard that the IPCC chose. This is the standard the IPCC said it was meeting. And when you actually bother to do a little bit of investigation, you find out it's total nonsense. So, you know, I don't have time here this evening, but my book goes into, in painful detail, um, the fact that there are a lot of other um, consensus views about what happens at the IPCC that are also mistaken. This notion that it is an utterly transparent organization, everything we do is open to scrutiny, says the chairman, no, that's not the case. Policies and procedures, you know, we, we read a lot, there's policies and procedures, and this is a, this is a uh, you know, a meticulous organization, except that they aren't followed, and there's no, um, there's no consequences if they're not followed. So it's like putting up, um, you know, uh, a, uh, a speed limit, but if there's no police officers enforcing that speed limit, what do you suppose is going to happen? Well, that's exactly what's been going on at the IPCC. They have rules but the rules aren't followed, there's no consequences. The IAC, that intergovernmental, that inter-academy council um, um, investigation said, well, you need some new rules, but the rules you have aren't being enforced, so you know, there's, there's some work to do. And as, as Bob Carter also mentioned, this notion that the IPCC relies only, solely, and exclusively on peer-reviewed research, no, no, no. One out of three uh, references in the 2007 report were to, um, were to material that were certainly never anywhere near a journal. Um, some of those were press releases, some of those were publications by Greenpeace and the WWF, some of them were student theses, some of them were news articles. You know, there is a great large list of, of um, information that was cited by the IPCC that had not been published in a peer-reviewed journal. And again, maybe that doesn't matter. Maybe some of those sources are reliable, but it's what the IPCC said, that it's the standard they set. So there are wider implications of this, and that's that lots and lots of people knew that the marketing message we were receiving about the IPCC was not true. Okay, there were thousands of people have been involved with the IPCC over the years. Those people knew that there were incompetent scientists from the third world as lead authors. Why did no one step forward and say the public is being misled? Where are the open letters signed by groups of scientists? We have seen all kinds of open letters from scientists in recent years about what governments should be doing to combat climate change. Where were the open letters saying, you know, we support the IPCC, but the public should know that they're being misled about some of these issues. No one spoke up. And what does that tell us then about the integrity of this organization and about its leadership? What other moral lapses have been going on that no one has mentioned? So my conclusion in my book is that the IPCC is not that um, upstanding professional and business attire who is trustworthy and reliable because, very simply, the IPCC has not described its own personnel, its own reports, or its own procedures accurately. If it can't do something that simple, we need our head examined if we're going to trust its, its opinions about something as complicated as climate change. That's my view. This is a troubled organization. It's a troubling organization. And I don't think any sane government should be passing laws or spending billions of dollars because the IPCC says so. Thank you. <laughs>